Welcome, this is Patrick Jaguer, the Cosmic Alchemist, and happy midwinter, happy Yule, Merry Christmas. So, the greeting I said in the beginning, Helogsal, is an Old Norse greeting. It basically, it's kind of a hello, and kind of really, what it roughly translates to is, you know, may you be whole, may you be healthy, you know, may you be well. So, I like it. So, today is, as I'm filming this, it's uh, Midwinter's Eve. You know, it's been Midwinter's Day. It's December the 21st, 2019. And, um, you know, usually in modern times, people call December 21st the first day of winter. And, you know, I guess in a manner of speaking, it is. But, you know, really, in the old world, December 21st was Midwinter's Day. So, even though the 90, well, excuse me, the 45 days, you know, because each season, four seasons, 90 days, the 45 days before December 21st haven't, you know, really been all that cold, you know, because if you go back 45 days, you go to about the 5th or 6th of November. So those haven't been terribly cold winter days. And really the coldest part of winter is still ahead. But and even the coldest parts of winter are in spring, if you use the old reckoning that I'm using now. So the difference is that, you know, in modern times, to mark the seasons, it's very cut and dry and very literal and obvious. So we say that the shortest day of the year is the beginning of winter. In the longest day of the year is the beginning of summer, but actually these solstices mark midwinter and midsummer. Even June 21st was called Midsummer's Day or Midsummer's Eve forever. So really calling the, the 21st of December the first day of winter is really a, it's a newfangled concept, you know, probably, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, maybe 100 years old. And so, this Midwinter's Day, this December 21st, is really a special day because it's the shortest day of the year and it's, it's a transition. It's really, it's the start of the transition into the next year. And in all cultures, you know, everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, December 21st and then December 25th, were really special days because after June 21st, after Midsummer's Day, the sun retreats farther south. So it goes roughly every day, it goes one degree south and it crosses the equator on the equinox. And the sun reaches its low point in the southern sky on December the 21st. And then the sun stalls there for three days so on the 22nd 23rd and 24th the sun stays at this low point and it seems to die for three days before it rises again so and then on the 25th scientifically observable the sun moves one degree north and it starts its its march it starts its journey back towards its height so it starts coming north and in the spring, the sun passes over the equator. That's why you have a Passover. So, the 25th was seen as a day of rebirth all around the Northern Hemisphere in every culture. And, um, you know, really, an interesting thing here is that the 25th of December is nine months from the 25th of March. So, this was, 
you know, in the Christian world, this was the, uh, the day that the, in the story, the angel visits Mary and she becomes pregnant, you know, the virgin conception and birth, you know, of Jesus and all that. So it's just, and that was on the 25th of March. So nine months later, you get December 25th. So, but the whole point is December 25th for ages before Christianity and, you know, and many cultures, December 25th was a day of rebirth and was really the New Year's Day from a solar standpoint, you know, to be really, you know, specific, you know, and kind of, uh, you know, accurate about it. So, you know, I still say Merry Christmas because that's the, that's what I grew up saying and that's the predominant culture here in America and here in the West and I'm happy with Merry Christmas, but, you know, I've also embraced the, um, kind of the Norse and the, the Germanic spirituality because I wanted to find something older than Christianity and I knew that in the Roman and the Christian era some really rich culture was was wiped out and you know suppressed so another word for this this time of year is Yule or Yuletide so Yule was in the Germanic countries so not just Scandinavia but Germany, even the long, the Lombards in Italy, I almost said long beard, but that's what Lombard means. And uh, so for them, this holiday was Yule. And Yule was really a, um, you know, it was a, it was a celebration of the coming rebirth of the sun. And it was sort of a, um, it was a way to give thanks for getting through the depth of winter, you know, you know, celebrating getting to that midpoint of winter and, uh, you know, kind of giving thanks, you know, in hopes of making it all the way through, you know, this is really, um, you know, in Iceland, they still eat a lot of, uh, traditional Yule foods. Like one of the things they eat is to commemorate a sheep's heads because that was one of the last things you wanted to eat now. And, and then the food stores, the, Sheep's heads are the last things to get eaten, you know, because they're they're pretty gnarly and uh, you know not very appetizing. But if you're hungry, you're willing to dig in. So Yule tide, Yule or Yule tide, eventually Yule tide eventually became the Christmas tide in uh, in Germanic countries, and um, you know Christianity has a really I mean not Christianity Christmas. Has a really interesting history, you know. And as I mentioned, you know, not only uh, was it celebrated in Germanic cultures, but even in ancient Rome, Rome, you had Saturnalia, and uh, Saturnalia was a uh, celebration of um, sort of dedicated to the planet Saturn, and it was right around you know winter solstice time. It was. Um, I think it went on for like six days. It was from like December 17th through the 23rd. And, you know, Saturn is, astrological terms, Saturn basically owns and rules all the other planets, even the sun, because Saturn rules karma. And, uh, you know, the sun represents our souls, and our souls are here in Saturn's world, because Saturn runs the 3D and enforces our karma and, you know, make sure we, we stick to our life paths authentically. So Saturnalia was, in ancient Rome, was a celebration where people would basically offer celebration and, you know, offerings to Saturn to ensure that Saturn would send the sun north again so they could have another summer. So Saturnalia was, was pretty interesting because it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a debaucherous feast, you know, typical Roman fashion of, uh, you know, excesses. And one thing that happened was social conventions were overturned. And, um, you know, things like public gambling were allowed. And even, you know, wealthy Romans would um, basically at the feasting, they would give table service to their slaves or to their, you know, to their uh, freemen employer, uh, employees. 
And um, so it was just, it was all about overturning, you know, social order. Because one thing Saturn is all about is Saturn is all about sort of fighting for the underdog. And, um, you know, because Saturn represents things like uh, civil service and community service and just, you know, doing good things for the, you know, kind of the, you know, the underprivileged. So that incidentally is where, you know, the whole concept of Carnival and Mardi Gras and all that comes from because Mardi Gras mm -hmm. and Carnival are presided over by King Saturn and actually in, in the Ro ancient Roman Saturnalia, a King Saturn was elected who would preside over the, the celebrations and the feasting and sort of, you know, kind of maintain the uh, sort of the, the disorderly order of it. So, and... Um, you know, this whole Saturnalia thing kind of came down to the modern times parallel to the to the Germanic Yule. So, you know, while the Germanic Yule was was pretty well preserved, you know, the uh, the Norse and Germanic traditions were they weren't really wiped out by the church. They kind of played possum, you know, especially in uh, in Iceland, for example. You know, Iceland preserved a lot of the the writings and the traditions and the and the lore and everything. So in the Catholic countries, Saturnalia kind of came down to the modern age. And, um, you know, especially like places like Italy, you know, France, for example. And um, it's pretty interesting, you know, so when the Roman Empire fell, people were basically kind of living in the rubble of the Roman Empire, even though Christianity had taken over. A lot of these pagan traditions were, were still around. And, uh, you know, and kind of a time that I sort of think we're going into. I think the paradigm and sort of the empire we've been living under is gonna, it's basically crumbling and we'll be in a, a transitional point where we're kind of living in the the aftermath and sort of the, the rubble of it, you know, in a very non-violent way. I think it's just more of a financial and a cultural collapse. But anyway, you know, they were, after the Roman Empire fell, they were kind of living in the aftermath of it. And they still had a lot of the, the old ancient Roman traditions that they were following. And, you know, there were times in, um, in medieval, medieval Europe when, you know, the Catholic clergy really wanted to get rid of Christmas. You know, and back then it was sometimes called the Christ Mass. And um, the Christ Mass was really, it was something that the people loved. And, uh, but the church didn't particularly like because, you know, it went on for 12 days. It, uh, went from December 25th through January the 6th, which is, you know, it's called the, um, the epiphany, which is, you know, the day that the three wise men were said to, you know, visited, you know, the infant Jesus, you know, and that whole thing. So it was just 12 days of, you know, no work feasting, drinking, gambling, you know, kind of whatever the hell you wanted to do. And the people loved it because they were serfs, you know, for the most part, you know, there were, there were merchants and, you know, people like that and, you know, craftsmen, but, you know, most of the people were serfs and they just, they wanted a day, you know, they wanted 12 days to cut loose and, you know, not really do much of anything. So it was sort of uh Christmas was kind of a, or the Christ mass was kind of a, kind of an elephant in the room for the church and you know at different times they wanted to get rid of it but you know the people almost revolted over it and you know the interesting thing is that the royals and the aristocrats often sided with the people because the royals and the aristocrats were often sort of competing for power and uh so when it came to things like traditions the royals and the aristocrats would get on the side of the people and they'd say, hey, we'll, we'll let you keep these traditions if you, you favor us over the church. And it's really what the, the political left and political right are today. It's the, you know, it's the evolution of the, uh, the left is like the medieval church and the, the right are the, the royals and the aristocrats. It's the same thing. You know, they both know what's best for the people and they, they use their angles to try to get support. So like a family torn apart. So the, um, you know, Christmas, the Christ mass survived in the Catholic countries that way. And, um, it's interesting in, uh, in the 1600s in England, 
during the rule of the Puritans, they tried to get rid of Christmas because it was seen as debaucherous and, and really non-biblical. And, uh, you know, there was sort of a, uh, there was kind of this, almost like a Hebrew sort of a revolution in England around that time where they wanted to get rid of everything that wasn't scriptural. And they kind of brought in a lot of uh, Hebrew names for the first time in England. You know, you started having names like Jeremiah and Obadiah and David and, um, you know, just biblical names, Jonathan, you know, names like that come in. So, you know, these sort of biblical centric and, you know, kind of Hebrew centric Puritans tried to wipe out Christmas and it got driven underground. And then when, when William of Orange came in after the, the death of Oliver Cromwell, he revived Christmas much to the, the joy of the people. And, um, so Christmas was back. And then an interesting thing is here in America, in colonial times, you know, especially in the in the Northeast, it really wasn't a big thing. And you know, Massachusetts, incidentally, was a was a Puritan colony for a long time. And, and Christmas was actually outlawed in Massachusetts until kind of the mid 1800s. I think it was about the 1850s. And they really looked down on it, and you know, they were pretty stodgy and you know, kind of tight asses. But it eventually came back as, as immigrants started coming from, from Ireland, from Italy, you know, from French Canada, places like that. They, uh, Christmas started, you know, kind of getting a shot in the ass and getting really popular among pretty much everyone. So it's just interesting how we have this, this celebration all over the world. And, uh, you know, the one I've, I've dug into most is this, this Norse and Germanic you know, look at it. And, um, you know, it's pretty neat. There was, um, you know, the, the Celtic cross symbol is, is all over the world. You know, it's like a cross with this, this circle around it. And, um, it's pretty cool. You see it everywhere. You know, it's known as the Celtic cross, but this was actually a symbol in China for a shaman. You know, it was, it was a solar symbol. And, um, in the Norse and Germanic traditions, the symbol was called the Eye of Odin. And so, interestingly enough, the Yule celebration was presided over by the Yule Father, who is also the All Father, so Odin. So, you know, the sun called the Eye of Odin was um, being reborn at this time. So, you know, and, and for you know, many thousands of years all around the world, the sun was sort of seen as the eye of God, you know, it was even, you know, called that, you know, straight up the eye of God. So, you know, the interesting thing about Odin is he's kind of, he, he is a, he's a personification of sort of a field of awareness that's pervasive through everything in the universe. You know, it's, you, you know, your body has its own awareness and intelligence that's you know, separate from your conscious mind and, you know, arguably all objects have it and, you know, animals certainly have it. So, so that's what Odin is. He's basically this, this awareness that's just everywhere in the, in the natural environment. So that's why the sun was called Eye of Odin or the Eye of God, because it's, it's like this you know, this awareness up in the sky or the eye of Ra, the sun is also called. So, so in this, this solar cell, so circling back in this solar rebirth celebration in the Yule tradition, you know, the, uh, Odin, the Yule father, who was symbolized by this, you know, this, this eye of Odin was, was ruled over this celebration. So as I have a Christmas tree behind me, you know, Christmas trees were part of the Germanic world. And, and that's a really fascinating subject about, you know, Christmas trees, actually, they're even seen in uh, Babylon and Sumer. I'm not going to get into that whole story, but Christmas trees come to us through the uh, through the Germanic countries, through Germans and Scandinavians, and you know you have the Yule log you put on the fire, and that's really a uh, you know it's a phallic symbol. It's a giant log, and uh, you know represents fertility and the you know the hopes of 
fertility for the coming year as the sun is reborn. You know, one of my favorite sites in Ireland is um, New Grange or uh, Baruna Boyne, as it's called. Well, it's Gaelic name. And, um, you know, the structure is um, estimated to be five or 6,000 years old and, you know, under conventional understanding mainstream science, you know, older than the pyramids. And, um, you know, it's made out of um, white quartz stones. And um, basically inside this structure, people, important people used to be, you know, buried in here, kind of, you know, preserved bodies were put in here. And um, the interesting thing about this building is that sunrise on Midsummer's Day shines directly in through the opening and actually lights the entire interior. And it was believed in those days that the, um, the souls of the, the dead people in there would actually ride that beam of light into the sun and, um, you know, into the next world. So, you know, people, people who had died in the course of that year between, you know, winter solstices, between midwinter's day would be preserved and kept in there. And once midwinter's day came around and their souls could ride that light into the sun, then they were, you know, buried, you know, properly, you know, and fully. So pretty interesting stuff. You know, December 25th has been, you know, huge all around the world. Um, an interesting thing too, actually in Sumer and Babylon, it was even an important day. And, you know, the Christmas tree comes from basically the, the resurrection story of uh, the King Nimrod. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into it, but he had this pine tree that was, that was cut down um, when he was killed. And upon his resurrection, a pine sapling sprouted out of the stump. So, you know, so many of these, these traditions we have are, you know, Indo-European or, you know, AKA Aryan, you know, and they go back to, to a lot of common roots. So I go on and on about this stuff, but I just kind of felt like uh, rambling a little bit about, you know, what the solstice and Christmas and Yule and, you know, Midwinter's Day, Midwinter's Eve is, you know, is all about. And, um, you know, the common thing here is that it's, it's all about celebrating the you know, the clearing out of the old year and the promise of a new year, you know, and what that can bring. So no matter what you call it, it's, uh, it's a great day. You know, and people, people argue over what to call it. And, you know, at work, you know, in the clinic for the past week, I've been saying Merry Christmas to people. And, you know, a lot of time, you know, here in, in, in the Northeast, you know, people do the happy holidays thing. And, uh, that just doesn't cut it for me. You know, I say Merry Christmas because I grew up with that. Um, if I know somebody celebrates something else, you know, I'll say it along with the Merry Christmas. I'll say Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah or, you know, whatnot. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not hip on the happy holidays. And it really doesn't matter what you call it. You know, whether it's uh, Christmas or Yule or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah or the... the uh, the Irish Gaelic term, which I'm not even going to take a crack at right now, <laughs> whatever the hell you call it, it's just all about giving thanks for the last year and, you know, letting go of that year so you don't have to carry it with you and, you know, really be dragged down, you know, by it, you know, just getting stuck on the things that happened in it. And it's all about being thankful for the coming year and you know all the the potential energy there because you know when the sun is at that low point and it starts rising again you just have this year of all this potential ahead of you so it's all about stepping back and just you know focusing on making it good you know making the best of it you know putting your your first foot forward with you know the the best of intentions and you know your heart in the right place so, 
Merry Christmas or a Happy Yule or you know whatever you call it. So thanks very much for tuning in. I hope you got something out of this video. I hope you got a lot out of it. And in the spirit of the coming year, strongly suggest that you get a reading from me. This is a roadmap for your life. It's basically the blueprint for how you work and how you interact with the world. It shows you, helps you to uncover, if you haven't found them already, your hidden gifts and your hidden talents. And it shows you your natural challenges and weaknesses and pitfalls and how to steer around those and, and even to how to improve upon those. And I also do rune readings in the, in the spirit of you know, Norse and Germanic Yule, and I have some Qigong videos for download, great mind-body practice to start the year with. So, thanks again for tuning in, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one.